Okay, so in this video I'm going to take a look at measuring nuclear size and in this specific video I'm going to take a look at Rutherford's alpha scattering experiment. So when you've watched this you should be able to do a few different things. So you should be able to describe the setup used in this original experiment. You should be able to describe the key observations. You should be able to explain how those inf observations are used to draw conclusions. You should be able to calculate the upper, an upper bound to the nuclear radius and you should be able to evaluate the alpha scattering experiment in terms of identifying the benefits of it and also the limitations and why ultimately they moved on to look at, at electron diffraction as a better method for measuring nuclear size. So let's move on. I've included here just a quick glossary of some of the terms. I'm not going to spend any time on it but flick back to it if you don't know what either ductile or multiple scattering means. Okay. So, describing the ex experimental setup. So, there are a few key things. So, essentially, what there was is there's some kind of alpha emitter here, which is giving you a beam of alpha particles going this way, something along those lines. And then, what you have is a piece of gold foil which has been stretched out. So we're going to massively blow it. So imagine this is our gold foil. This is not the scale diagram I hasten to add. And then what you have all around here, so you would put alpha detector all the way around this experiment and you'd measure the number of alpha particles that arrive at each of the locations around it. Now, so why gold? Well, gold is highly ductile, which means it's stretched until it's very thin. And the advantage of being thin is you prevent multiple scattering. So if you imagine, if it's many atoms thick, that means there are many nuclei. And if you have it really thin, you're going to minimise the number of nuclei thick your gold is. And by minimising that, you're essentially minimising the opportunity to be scattered multiple times. So what I mean by that being scattered multiple times, so say we had one come in here, it was scattered by this one, and then scattered by this one here. So it's been scattered twice, which is multiple scattering. What you want is just one that comes in, is scattered, and then it follows the same path, is unaffected by something else. So, that's the experimental setup, or the fundamentals of the experimental setup. I must hasten to add at this point, Ernst Rutherford didn't actually do the experiment. His lab techies did all this practical work. But as a supervisor, he gets credit for it. There you go. So, let's look at describing the key observations from the experiment. So, once they'd fired the alpha particles, they'd moved the detector all around and totted up the number that arrived in each location. There were three key observations. So, first one is, most of the alpha particles passed through the foil completely undeflected. So, those are shown by these red lines here. So, no change in the direction of the line means they're undeflected. Second key observation. Well, about 1 in 2000, these numbers fluctuate from textbook to textbook, but it's around this number. Alpha particles were just deflected, and what that means is, so if we have one coming in here, oh wow, that's pretty horrific. Let me try that one again, try and get a little bit straighter at least. Okay, so it's coming in, it's coming in, and it's deflected away something like this. So it's just deflected. And then 1 in 10,000 were actually deflected by more than 90 degrees. So it's coming in, it's coming in, and it's bent backwards. So this one would be 90 degrees here, and it's bent back by more than that. And those ones that bend back are included in those 1 in 2,000. So 1 in 2,000 is all deflections, and the 1 in 10,000 is just these ones here, which were deflected by more than 90 degrees. So those are the key observations. In terms of explaining what conclusions you can draw from these observations, the fact that most pass through undeflected means that 
most of the atom is empty space. They're not deflected. They haven't encountered anything. There's nothing there. Okay? So that's the first conclusion. So from the fact that about 1 in 2,000 were deflected, told you the nucleus was positively charged because the alpha particles, which themselves are positively charged, were deflected away by the nucleus. So that told you it was positively charged. The last thing, the fact that 1 in 10,000 were deflected by more than 90 degrees, told you that the nucleus was highly positively charged. So it had a very strong electromagnetic field around it, and it was strong enough to reverse the direction of your alpha particle. So if we, it means, so if you have your nucleus here, essentially this last one is looking at specifically the cases where you're deflected by more than 90 degrees, like this. So those are the conclusions that were drawn. And the last part is looking at actually what calculations you can do based on this. So you can actually use this experiment to calculate the an approximate nuclear radius, or at least the upper limit of the nuclear radius anyway. And you do this by equating two key phenomena. So you have an alpha particle traveling at a known kinetic energy, and you could perhaps use some sort of electric field to accelerate it to a known kinetic energy. And once you've done that, if you direct it at an alpha particle, you know that if it's deflected by more than 90 degrees, at some point it must have become stationary and stopped approaching the nucleus, turned around, and then accelerated away from the nucleus again. And so at that point, you know all of the initial kinetic energy would have been transferred into electric potential energy, which you should remember from unit 4, is calculated like this. And this R here gives you the closest distance of approach. And that's the first estimate for the nuclear size. So let's look at a worked example of doing this method. So you've got an alpha particle traveling at six mega electron volts of kinetic energy. And it's fired at a golden nucleus. Find the distance of closest approach. So the first key thing is to convert it into joules, things we're gonna use in an equation. So let's do that. So if we put those numbers in, we've got this conversion factor here, so the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. We've got the number of mega electron volts, gives you the number of joules. Now remember, at the distance of closest approach, your kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy, which is calculated by doing Q Q over 4 pi E 0 R. And rearranging that to a useful form, our closest approach is calculated by the charge of gold multiplied by the charge of alpha all over these constants multiplied by the kinetic energy. So we plug in some numbers. So a gold nucleus has 79 protons. So that's going to be plus 79e. A alpha particle has two protons. So that's going to be times by plus 2e. 4 pi e0 multiplied by 9.6 times 10. So minus 13 which gives you a approximate radius of 3.8 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. So it's about or 0.4 femtometers approximately. And looking at the data you've been given, one of your numbers was to one sig fig, the rest was to two, so you give your answer to two sig figs. Because unless it's a quantum number, you don't give answers to one significant figure there. So this is the first estimate for the nuclear radius of an atom. So just in case you couldn't read anything from that, that is all shown in this worked solution here. I'll move on. Feel free to pause and take a look at that. And the last thing I said we're going to do is look at actually the benefits and limitations of the alpha scattering experiment. 
So the key thing was, before this experiment, Thompson's plum pudding model was the model that was prevailing amongst scientists. That was the one that was generally accepted. So they, at that point, they didn't know about the nucleus or the fact that the majority of the atom was empty space. So actually it was a very revolutionary experiment. So despite its limitations, it had a big impact on the current thinking of scientists. And the other thing it allowed was you actually calculate what the size of the nucleus was, or at least approximate what the size of the nucleus was. And that, again, is a useful thing to know when you're developing your model for atomic structure and then when you're moving on to look at electron shells and that sort of thing. But there are some problems with these and this is why in the end they moved on to using electron diffraction which I'll look at in another video as a way of calculating your nuclear radius. So one of the things in your distance of closest approach calculation was you're assuming that the only force acting on it was the electromagnetic interaction. But when we're starting to get into the sorts of ranges we're talking about in these questions, the alpha particle and the nuclei can also interact through the strong nuclear interaction. So it won't behave exactly as you predict. The model assumes it is single scattering. So earlier I talked about how having gold makes it unlikely for having multiple scattering, but it is in theory possible, but this model assumes that you only get one scattering. And it's also only an approximation, so it's giving you an upper bound for the nuclear size. But you haven't actually directly measured what the nuclear radius is, and that's where electron diffraction comes into its own. And I should point out the other thing we haven't considered here is the fact that the alpha particle it was assumed to essentially keep all of the kinetic energy um, uh, once it had been in and out of being at the nucleus. But in reality, the nucleus would actually recoil from the collision because obviously the nucleus has mass and is capable of moving. So when you looked, just as when you looked at collisions in Unit 4, you could in theory have the nucleus recoiling from the impact and actually losing some kinetic energy, something that was missed in all of the calculations we were doing.